Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. Today is a very exciting day as I got to interview SMP. And in case you're new to investing, SMP is well known around the world as the creator of some of the most widely used indices. For example, they are the ones that actually created and manage the SP 500 index and the SP Dow Jones and many others. So if you're an index investor or have even just glimpsed at any financial news channel, website, or even movie that has to do with the stock market, then you've probably seen the SP 500 and Dow Jones index displayed or mentioned as many investors use this as an indicator to how the markets are doing on any given day. On today's interview, we're going to be covering the SPIVA scorecards, which are semi-annual reports published by SMP that compare the performance of active equity and fixed income funds against their index over different time horizons. In other words, when you hear the debate of whether you should be a passive index investor or be an active investor, the SPIVA scorecards actually look at how well the active managers have done compared to just investing in the index. Now, typically, when you buy an actively managed mutual fund, for example, you are paying significantly more in terms of fees versus just buying something like a total market index CTF. But your hope in that scenario is that those higher fees you pay for the actively managed fund are offset by the much higher returns you're going to get compared to just buying the index. But does this actually happen? How often do these actively managed funds actually beat the index? Is it a worthwhile risk for you to pay those higher fees in hopes that the performance of your investment will more than offset them? Or do you just pay the rock bottom fees on the total market index ETFs and accept the returns of the market? And by the way, if you go for the actively managed funds, you have to pay those higher fees no matter how well or badly the investment performs. So there are definitely cases where investors pay the higher fees and the investment actually underperforms the index. Plus, you're also paying higher fees for that investment versus if you just bought the index. So our guests today are Joe Nelson from SMP and Aaron Allen from BMO ETFs. Joe is the Senior Director of Index Investment Strategy over at SMP, and Aaron is the Vice President over at BMO ETFs, which is the largest Canadian provider of ETFs. So I thought we could have both Joe and Aaron on the show, as this way we can learn more about the insights and discoveries learned from the SPIVA reports when it comes to the active versus passive debate. And since Aaron and her team actually create these ETFs for Canadians, we discuss how to actually practically apply these SPIVA findings and insights when constructing or optimizing our own investment portfolio. In other words, what to look for and things to watch out for when we are actually building, optimizing, and deciding which ETFs to use for our own portfolio. So enjoy the interview. And if you like this kind of education, I'm actually in the process of creating a free six-day mini course showing you the details of how I personally invest just to keep everything transparent, what investments I buy, the tools I use, and how I optimize my investments and finances to pay the least in unnecessary fees and taxes here in Canada. To get it, just sign up anywhere for free over at Build Wealth Canada. .ca, and I'll send you the course the moment it's ready. And it might even be ready now, depending on when you are listening to this episode. So I look forward to sending that to you. Thanks for tuning in. And now let's get into the interview. All right, Joe and Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Cornell. Thank you. Joe, to start things off with you, to make this friendly to anybody new to the world of investing, can you start by telling us a bit about SMP as well as the Spivo reports and why they are important for us everyday investors? Sure, Cornell, and I hope you'll indulge me for a minute with a brief bit of history to lead up to where we are today with Spiva. So one of the things that's interesting about the S&P Dow Jones indice story, uh, it starts back in the 1880s, really, when a fellow named Charles Dow created really the first index to track the daily prices of, of transportation stocks. You know, fast forward, as most, most folks know, an index is essentially a number. It's a, a way to track an aggregate set of values like a bunch of stock prices from a particular market or country or sector and beyond. And in his case, it was transportation stocks that he published daily in what became the Wall Street Journal. Now, perhaps two of the most well-known and longest running indices we run here at S&P are the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500. 
And if you fast forward to today, we actually calculate hundreds of thousands of indices across virtually every asset class and geography, et cetera. These are used by investors, researchers, media, and everyone in between just to gauge what's happening in the world and to build investment products around. Now, what's really been the revolution we're all aware of is the rise of index investing, which I think came probably around the 1970s and, and more popularized perhaps 30 years ago with the alongside the first S&P 500 ETF uh, came out to market. And since then, thousands of other index funds and ETFs have launched and become widely used among all kinds of investors, um, including all of us. Most of these tend to have lower average fees than many active mutual funds, and more and more investors are embracing indexing, moving assets out of, of active mutual funds and into index funds. We're seeing this uh, flow year after year. Now, when it comes to SPIVA, this is a report we launched in 2002 for the first time we did the research. It stands for S&P Indices versus Active. And it's, it's pretty much what the name would imply. It's an answer to the common question we started getting back then and continues today, which is how often and when do active managers outperform their benchmarks? It's a regular series of research reports where we compare managers to appropriate benchmarks for their category. We use markets around the world, including Canada, US, and Europe, among others. And the purpose is to really take a data-driven view on what performance looks like over every period. We do this looking over short and long time horizons, or annual basis. We also do a six-month report halfway through the year. And so we've just now released the 2022 speed reports for Canada and the U.S., more of them are following over the coming weeks. And I'll finish not saying one, one thing that's important to note is that the methodology is consistent, right? We, we look at four really important things, which is our, our survivorship. So we're taking into account funds that you know may have uh, disappeared over time, and, but are still part of the investor experience for a lot of people. We also look at style consistency, right? If a manager changes from one category to another, are they still benchmarked appropriately? We also look at asset-weighted returns, all right? And so more popular funds would have a greater impact on the average return in some of our tables. And finally, we're looking at, you know, apples to apples comparisons. So value managers versus value benchmarks, for example. Finally, we we, we disclose the methodology. So I, I think it's important you're thinking back to, you know, middle school science reports, and you've got to do your write-up and say, how did you do this experiment? You know, what were your methods. Anybody could repeat this if they use the same data sources that we do. And we provide commentary around what happened in the market uh, in each instance to analyze the rate of outperformance and, and why it happened or didn't happen. Yeah, it's really exciting to have you on. Long-term listeners of the show know that I've brought up Spiva many, many times and referred many listeners of the show to it. And so it's nice to actually have someone from that team on the show and you can kind of take us through the ins and outs of it and the methodology and all of that. So it's, yeah, definitely it's as like a, you know, finance business nerd <laughs> for myself, it's definitely exciting to actually have someone from, uh, from your team. You carry Spiva reports around with me well before I worked here at S&P. So it was sort of, you know, a tool in, in many conversations. And I think we all followed and I was I'm glad to be part of. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Whenever somebody asks me, oh, I'm, sh should I do active? Should I do passive index investing? My kind of go-to has always been, okay, just check out the Spivo reports. That pretty much tells you the story. And that's basically the the way of thinking that I subscribe to myself when, when I invest. So uh, it's great. Now, the Spivo analysis, it has over 20 years of data at this point. Can you speak to what these decades of analysis has taught you and individual investors about passive and active management around the world. Sure, as I as I mentioned, we we run these reports across in many regions, many uh, categories, small, mid, large. But one number I'll start with to share is ninety five percent. Think of that number, ninety five percent. That is the proportion of U.S. large cap active managers who've underperformed the S and P five hundred over the last twenty years. And I think that's an important number. It's a long-term number, clearly, you know, given over the whole horizon that we've been doing these reports. We also do one, three, five, 10, 15 year analyses. But what it shows us is that active outperformance, as you noted, Cornell, is, is really, really hard. It's really hard to achieve. It's not impossible, right? There's alpha out there, but statistically it's rare over longer periods of time. And investors of all types and sizes that I know have have you know readjusted their approach to portfolios as a result of this. I think. You know, the promise of active management is really that with enough skill that it's easy to consistently outperform the market or the benchmark. And, you know, in, investors and academics and journalists have been challenging this view for a long time. And with an, the, a debate in the middle of it all that demands something like SPIVA uh, to help inform the data. 
And so I really think that even if you, you know, can recognize, you can take a sharp perspective, there's the alpha out there, but it's ultimately a zero sum game. Someone has to lose for someone else to win. They can't all do it. We find that, you know, after 20 years, there are really three major conclusions based on the data. And, and you can you can see the, the data in the reports um, easily on the web. The first is that gross of fees, most active managers underperform most of the time. Most institutional managers underperform most of the time. And even after adjusting for risk, uh, it's the same story. The second is that the tendency for underperformance typically rises as the observation period gets longer. So we started looking at U.S. equity managers over shorter horizons, then we added things like fixed income, international. We see the same result and the underperformance rates, which is generally how we report things, really tends to increase in every case over longer time horizons. And finally, when good performance does occur, which it does at times, uh, it tends not to persist. In other words, above average past performance does not predict above average future performance. That's something you know we, we could talk about if we get to persistence later. So really, you know, speed but can serve, I think, two purposes. One is to remind investors like me and others that you know, if you choose to hire active managers, the odds mathematically are really against them. And for those few active managers who do find themselves outperforming the benchmark. Spiva can serve as a marketing tool for them to communicate to their investors how unusual their outperformance may be. Great. Yeah, the way I've always approached it is, yes, there are some that may beat it, but as an individual investor, do you really want to play that game where you're constantly trying to find the best ones and then hope that they can continue their performance? Do you want to be on the hunt always for you know, the one that can do it, which is really hard to do as your reports have illustrated, or do you just want to do the indexing and go and live your life. <laughs> and so I've, I've subscribed, I've myself, and then, I mean, I'm not telling people what to do. Everyone's got their own personal preferences. Some people do like to play that game and then that's, you know, teach his own or her own. But I find for myself, I also find it's just, you know, you do the indexing and then you can go on and you can <laughs> do other things in your life that you want to do instead of always kind of being on the prowl and always hoping that they continue to outperform. Just for anybody that wants to follow along, you're mentioning uh, some stats here, some of the findings. Can you tell listeners where they can actually, what the easiest way is to access these SPIVA reports? They are updated periodically, as you already mentioned. What is the, the easiest way to find them for anybody that wants to follow along? Quite frankly, we've been around long enough and they're widely enough read that you can just Google a SPIVA scorecards S&P and you'll find our site pretty easily. We have a landing page, spindices.com will also get you there. And you'll not only find SPIVA reports, but also a really great body of you know, blogs and papers that kind of explain why this happens, right? It's not just, you know, random chance. There are really kind of structural and repeated things going on in, in the asset management industry that, that make it difficult for our performance to persist. For sure. And I will link out to that in the show notes as well for anybody watching. If you go to buildwealthcanada.ca, you'll you'll see it kind of on the front page, all the latest episodes. You'll see this one. And then you can click there and I'll, I'll be sure to link out to, to all the different resources that we, we mentioned today. I wanted to uh, discuss one thing with you. So like I said, I'm kind of more of the, the passive type of investor. Some people are very much on the active side, but there's also sort of this, this hybrid investor, right? Where they have some active and some passive. And that's an approach that I've seen a lot of professionals um, recommend, or at least say, Hey, you know, you should at least consider sort of being a hybrid investor as well, because that is an option. And, you know, you kind of choose what's best for you. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think as you mentioned, it all comes down to personal preference and there are investors out there who do have a favorite active manager who, you know, they believe is delivering value to them. Um, so that's where that core and satellite approach that we always talk about comes in and, and can be an effective way to do it is to hold the majority of your portfolio in these index-based passive ETFs. Um, and then have a portion, whether it's 10, 15% of your portfolio that uh, you can um, try to seek alpha in, you can try to beat the benchmark in. Um, and that can, that satellite area of your portfolio can, you know, take many forms. Maybe you're going to invest in a particular theme. Uh, maybe you're passionate about clean energy. Um, or if it's, or if you want to take a sector rotation approach in that satellite and, you know, move cyclically in and out of the sectors, uh, depending on where you want to be. There's many different ways you can do it, or you pick your favorite active manager and you put and you put that in your satellite sleeve. Uh, so definitely approach a lot of people take is that core satellite approach. 
And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. There are so many opinions on how to invest your money today, but it can be hard to find credible voices to rely on in the world of finance and investing. One resource that I turn to every week is the ETF Market Insights YouTube channel led by today's episode sponsor, BMO ETFs. Market Insights brings in industry experts and the weekly episodes cover the hottest themes like inflation, infrastructure, healthcare, and more. Tuning in helps me stay up to date on what's happening so I can be a smarter investor. And you can also submit your own ETF questions to be answered on the show. So do yourself a favor and subscribe on YouTube to ETF Market Insights or visit ETFMarketInsights.com so you can be notified when future episodes go live. And now back to the show. From your experience, Aaron, do in Canada with DIY investors, is that the path that most investors take where maybe, you know, they have that core, but then they also, you know, maybe there's a few stocks that they invest in, like they're an Amazon or Tesla fan, or maybe they do more active ETFs as well. Is, is that very common? Have you found, or is there, is it usually that you're kind of active or passive? <laughs> It's hard. It's hard for me to say, but I will say by looking at like the trends that the different robo advisors or or discount brokers are going in. Uh, you know, take Wealth Simple as an example. Uh, they started with that core passive um, portfolio. They've since introduced Wealth Simple Trade um, to to give those uh, people who want a little bit more of an active approach an outlet for that. So that gives me an indication that there is that demand for for that uh, DIY satellite type position in the portfolio. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting that you brought them up. I do remember reading uh, some news stories about how even their, or even listening to some podcasts on it, how they have actually kind of changed their portfolio a little bit where there is like a little bit of an active component there as well, which is so interesting because I remember when these robo advisors first started in Canada, it was very much, you know, the, the, or at least the communication from the marketing side was just, you know, this, you get to do index investing, very low cost. That's what we do. And then it's like you mentioned, it's interesting how some have incorporated a bit of an active element. And I wonder if it, that is because there are many investors who are like, okay, I like my core, but I still want to tweak things a little bit here and there. I still want to do things a bit differently. Passive's so yeah, very, very boring, interesting. right? You need something to talk about at uh, your, your dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't get. I don't get asked too much about my hot, you know, core <laughs> ETF picks at Christmas parties. <laughs> that's true. Now, Aaron, for those like myself who are totally on board with what the Spiva findings suggest and are looking to just have an easy to manage investment portfolio, where they're just looking to buy the total market index. What are the options available to them in Canada? And can you take us through the pros and cons of these different approaches? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's really two different approaches. One would be the tr traditional DIY approach where you buy a number of individual index-based ETFs and you build your own diversified portfolio within that. And then the second would be to look at uh, an all-in-one solution like an asset allocation ETF. Uh, so for the first option, that traditional DIY approach, this, this could look like buying ZCN, ZSP, and ZEA to drop a few BMO tickers, um, Canada, US, and international equity exposures, right? Um, and then you might tie in a, a fixed income component, component as well, bringing in ZEG, an aggregate bond index. Um, and, you know, based on your time horizon and your, your risk tolerance and all of that good stuff, you would weight those ETFs appropriately in your portfolio. Um, so that's definitely one approach. Uh, I guess the the, the the pros are that it's cost effective. Um, all these ETFs are obviously very low cost. Add to that, a lot of them are trading for free on a lot of discount brokerages. Uh, so really low cost option. Um, and then I'd also say that it's really flexible. Um, flexible in a couple of ways. It, can, it gives you the flexibility to buy different ETFs from different providers. If I like BMO's ZSP, but I like iShares for emerging markets, I can I can do that. Um, and flexible in that you can also take an asset location approach, uh, which I think we've talked about before, Cornell, where you can put your less tax efficient ETFs in your registered plan and your more tax efficient ETFs in your non-registered plan. So some investors like to like to do that, and building your own portfolio will give you will give you that flexibility too. Um, I think the cons. You know, it's relatively simple, but it does take time. It takes knowledge in terms of how to build that well-diversified portfolio. What geographies are you going to include? How do I weight them? Um, 
And then I'd say the other issue that you run into when you're doing this is around rebalancing. If you're not disciplined and you're rebalancing, you can end up with a completely different looking portfolio at the end of the year than the one you started out with if equities take off or something. And that could mean you're not, you know, within your risk tolerance and you're not on the right path to reaching your goals. Um, and then on the flip side, asset allocation ETFs, a more recent innovation in the ETF space, just five years old. Uh, these are really just professionally managed ETFs that invest in a basket of underlying index-based ETFs. And those are set to strategic weights and they're rebalanced back to those weights over time for you. Uh, so really simple solution, a lot less time for you to decide what to invest in. Um, and you also avoid that, I guess, emotional hurdle around rebalancing, which is really uh, selling your winners and allocating back to your losers. That can be pretty psychologically hard for a lot of people, but really important studies have shown over the long term, uh, it can add value to your portfolio. So these asset allocation ETFs do that for you as well. Another benefit, they're extremely low cost. So 20 basis points all in MER. That includes the cost of the underlying ETFs, includes the professional management, and includes the rebalancing. So uh, there's also a lot of options available for investors out there. Uh, depending on the risk tolerance that they can invest in when it comes to asset allocation ETFs too. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you brought up the two different challenges. There's the sort of mechanical, how do I rebalance my portfolio component? And then there's, but there's also that emotional psychological one as well, where, okay, I know how to do this mechanically, which that alone can be a struggle for some people because you know you might be dealing with spreadsheets again, things of that nature. I, I use passive where like it does it automatically, but still like there's a learning curve, you know, but then, yeah, the psychological thing is interesting. I, I've talked to so many investors where, you know, they buy these individual ETFs and they're supposed to be rebalancing, but then, you know, they pull up their, their the tickers and they see you know, something they don't like. And they're like, oh, I'm going to wait a little bit before I do it. Oh, I'm, you know, and then they, they start playing this kind of waiting game instead of rebalancing. So now they're actually kind of trying to time the market. And I find it such an easy trap to fall into. Like I, I've been tempted to do that as well. And I had to sort of consciously stop myself and say, no, 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 just, just go now. <laughs> don't, don't wait for these, you know, you're, you're not all of a sudden going to be predicting which way, you know, the, your, your SMP ETF is going to go. So yeah, very, very great that you brought up both of those points. Joe, switching things over to you. One of the reports that I've always found fascinating that you publish is the persistent scorecard that you publish. And you, and you mentioned this briefly earlier. Can you speak to what it is, where can listeners find it, and what is the role of persistence when you're measuring active outperformance? Sure. Uh, to start with, I think you'll find it in, in kind of the same place, right? The persistent scorecards are really companion pieces to the SPIVA reports. Uh, you can search S&P, you know, SPIVA persistence, US, Canada, whatever, and you'll, you'll find them. Uh, I hope so. Uh, I, I was able to anyway, but the uh, is persistence is kind of what it sounds like. It's one of the most common re responses, I think, to a question I would get, you know, when I would take Speed in my hand to go to a meeting, for example, of, of a, a you know a pension or someone who's an active uh, fund buyer, and I'd say, look, what percentage of, of active funds underperform all the time? And they'd say, that's all well and good, but we only buy the best managers, right? We only pick the good ones. Um, and you, you, you uh, touched upon this earlier. That's that's very difficult, right? Then you, you can do all the diligence in the world, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't not matter. Uh, but the persistent scorecard tells you how many among those funds that beat the benchmark in the past year continue to do so persistently. Um, the implication here is not only for the managers themselves, but also for the fund selectors, as I mentioned. So I'll give you a few example statistics. Uh, our latest persistent scorecards, by the way, came out uh, to cover through the mid year of 2022. So following our speed of cycle and you know, later this spring, we'll have uh, new reports for the full year. But some of those data are, are interesting uh, and consistent with prior years. For example, in Canada, among Canadian domiciled actively managed uh, domestic equity funds with top quartile uh, performance as of the end of June 2020, can you guess what percentage remained in the top quartile over the next two years? Less than I haven't I haven't checked the most recent ones, but I know it's it's pretty low. Um, so I'll say under twenty percent. Well, the answer is zero. So you're correct. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's zero that 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 stayed there. We we show the drop off in the report over year one and two, and it it goes uh, down quite dramatically. So if you pick the top quartile fund, did your diligence uh, in the active category as of June twenty twenty. 
um, all of those uh, would have gone out of that top quartile within two years. That's the same story in global equity and U.S. equity funds domiciled in Canada. None of them uh, persisted for three 12-month periods. The only exception we found was, uh, uh, at least as of that June 2022 report, was international equity, where um, a whopping 12% of the funds stayed in the top quartile over three 12-month periods. Uh, so it, it's non-zero there, but you know you go out to five years and it becomes zero for every single category. And going back to you know, what what Aaron talked about with uh, the discipline of rebalancing, and, the, and you touched on Cornell with psychology, the tough choices. You know, one must ask themselves: Could I have uh, predicted in advance that which among that twelve percent would be you know the, the right one? Um, I know myself, and I, it's a tough it's a tough thing to do. Again, nothing is statistically impossible, but these are the kind of data that that suggests it's a very uh, challenging prospect to find that manager who may be out there, but, you know, uh, ex ante, can, can you locate them? Yeah, I've always been a big fan of these the persistence reports because I, as Canadians, we get pitched these uh, active funds all the time. And, you know, if, if a fund had a good year, obviously that's what the person's going to show us and, and saying, hey, and, and I know what kind of the common sales thing is, oh, well, look, we beat the index last year. So clearly we can do it. So why would you do the index investing when you can just go with us? Look how much we beat it by. And so I really like referring people to these persistence reports because I can say, okay, that may be true, but how? What are the, what's? What do you think the chances are that they're going to be able to do this? You know, every single year, long term, and and you're you're saving for your retirement long term. And so you know, you're not you don't really care so much over one year. You're caring over these longer time periods, which is what you guys look at. So, uh, yeah, I find these has been really, really, really helpful for for key investors and just for communicating how, um, you know, to, to kind of not be swayed by these slick sales presentations. Can you maybe as well speak to survivorship bias? I know that is one other kind of common sort of sales tactic that is used sometimes here in Canada. Uh, what do you mean by as a sales tactic, for example? In terms of saying or like most of our funds have beaten the index. So you should clearly go with us. And it's like, okay, well, but you also kill the ones that don't, that underperform. So they're not really showing up. I'm referring to okay, that. Okay. Thank you. you know, so as I, yeah, as I mentioned at the outset, and I'll, you know, I'll say uh, again, because I do think you, you raise a very important point. Uh, it's important with these kinds of data to, to take into account the funds that were liquidated. Because uh, more often than not, funds that were liquidated were underperforming, couldn't attract assets as a result, right? And so if you put yourself in the investor's uh, shoes 10, 20 years ago, those funds were out there marketing themselves, right? And um, that that factors into the percentage that underperform. Uh, so you'll see in all of our speed reports, a table in the back that shows survivorship over various periods of time. But not only uh, in terms of how many funds were merged or liquidated and how many remained, uh, but also style changes, which I think is a key thing to consider, uh, as I may have mentioned prior, you know, the beginning around appropriate benchmarks. Uh, if you think about a value manager and, and what the value factor has been through, if you followed it the last, you know, 10, 15 years, uh, it's been a tough time for value, right? And, and this is a popular active strategy. And so I've seen plenty of managers who will, uh, you know, squeeze in a few growth oriented stocks from time to time, uh, try to enhance the return. I mean, they're active, they can do that. But if they're doing it to a degree that it's really a strategy change, or even if they state that they're going through a strategy change, then we take that into account in the survivorship table and note that that these man this percentage of managers went through a style change, right? They basically changed their whole approach in response to the markets. And um, as a allocation exercise, for example, you know, if you're following the, the advice that, that Aaron and others would give and you're picking a value manager, you make sure that value manager remains a value manager over time. And that's that's really part of what survivorship is about. Okay, so if they change their strategy, let's say, and then and they are able to maintain their status as being in in that you know as a top performer, would they not be included because they did change their strategy? We so if we can if we can tell that they you know, if they formally change their strategy, then they shouldn't be really included in that you know category for the period. If they change it in year one and year ten, we're looking at you know growth funds, but one of them is no longer a growth fund. Um, they shouldn't be included there, right? But it's it would go into that bucket of style change uh, of, of funds, right? And so it's just it's important to note that this happens, and as an investor, you kind of want to uh, 
um, monitor, you know, what is happening with the strategy that is staying in the parameters that you expected it to when you put it into your portfolio. Gotcha. And Aaron, switching things over to you, when it comes to the core ETFs and asset allocation ETFs that try to mimic the index, one of the critical metrics that individual investors need to be aware of is the tracking error, especially when trying to choose a comparable ETF from one provider to another. Can you take us through what tracking error actually is? Why is it important? And how can we actually check it ourselves? Yeah, for sure. So tracking error is just sort of what it sounds like. It's the difference between the actual returns of the ETF and the returns of the the index. So if you're an ETF investor, you definitely need to understand uh, what this is. So so definitely a great question. Um, You know, since these ETFs, index-based ETFs we're talking about right now, uh, are built to mirror the performance of that particular index, you definitely want to keep an eye out for any major uh, differences in the two returns there. You know, minor differences, they're not going to have an impact on your returns much over time, and they could have you know, it could be because of just the MER, uh, but other factors might lead to sort of that widening of the tracking error, and that's what you really need to 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 be aware of. So, of course, lower the the lower the tracking error, the more closely the ETF is tracking uh, the benchmark. The higher the tracking error, the less closely it's tracking it. So, you know, I always think about it. If you're investing in an ETF that's tracking the S and P 500, you want to track the S and P 500. If I want to buy a BMW and I go into a dealership and I end up with a Honda, I'm going to be pretty pissed off. So, you want to make sure that you're getting the return uh, for for your investment and what you've what you've uh, signed up for. And then, if you want to check it, you can go to uh, the ETF provider's website. If you go to just the per- general performance tab, it's going to show you the returns of the ETF and the returns of the benchmark. And you can either just compare those, you know, if the benchmark is returning five and a half percent over three years and the ETF is um, getting you 5%, then you have a a 50 basis point tracking period over that period. Um, Additionally, every mutual fund and ETF in Canada is required to file a uh, management report of fund performance, which is an MRFP. And I come from the product side of uh, ETFs, so I used to be heavily involved in the production of these, unfortunately. Um, But the document does include uh, a lot of really valuable information, including your tracking error. Uh, But what it also includes is a little point or two on rationale for that tracking error. So if you do go to the website and you see there's a wider tracking error, you can pull up that MRFP and there there should be a bit of a rationale in terms of, of why that's gotten a bit bigger in it. Every ETF provider has a different MRFP layout, but it'll always fall under the results of operations section. Um, And and that's where you'll find that reasoning, which is just a key thing to look at. Okay. So if we wanted to see one, let's say for one of your your BMO index ETFs, is it available on that particular... Yeah, it's ETF specific. Drill down to see that full report. Yeah. So if you go to, it's usually under the documents section of the ETF website, at least it is ours. Uh, they'll have an MRFP section, uh, and then you can pick the ETF that you're invested in and, and drill down that way. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. These are our hiring goals, they say. They're very aggressive. But when everyone looks to you, you're calm. Why? Because you know you don't need a miracle. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Indeed's hiring platform helps you easily schedule and conduct virtual interviews all in one place. And Indeed streamlines hiring with powerful matching tools that find you matched candidates fast. On Indeed, over 85% of employers find quality candidates whose resumes match their job description the moment that they sponsor a job, according to Indeed data. One of the things that I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because the moment you post a job on Indeed, you get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes match your job description, and you can even invite them to apply right away. So start hiring now with a $100 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash build wealth. Offer is good for a limited time. Again, you can claim your $100 credit now at Indeed dot com slash build wealth terms and conditions apply and now back to the show 
you kind of mentioned this, I think, or alluded to it, but this is a pretty regulated process, it sounds like. So it's not like a provider of an ETF can just kind of fudge the numbers or you know make them look a little bit better than they really are. Like, like this is something that you guys have to submit um, and there's all this regulation behind it to make sure that everything is actually correct. Is that true? Yep, exactly. It's a okay. legal and gotcha. reg- regulatory document. Yeah. So I guess that's why you say for that reason, if you are trying to look up those numbers, you might as well just go directly to the provider site, like in this case, like BMO ETFs or, you know, one of the other ones, because you know, that information there is, is accurate. Uh, Cause I've, you know, cause with other, in other parts of life, right. When we see sort of the, you know, the marketing, it's like, well, are these numbers actually correct? And you question and are they, you know, but in your case, I guess in the, in the sort of finance investing ETF world, it's so heavily regulated that you can actually trust that number that like, if you go on a BMO ETF and we see tracking error, we know that that's actually correct. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Those are audited numbers on, on the, uh, on the website and on the, on the legal document there. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, and I forgot to mention earlier as well, what I'll do, cause we were talking, you were talking about core ETFs and you listed some examples as well. So I can, I'll add those to the show notes as well so that anybody can click on the link and you can actually look it up and, and then there you'll see the tracking error and, and, you know, the MER and everything else that Aaron was talking about. So, uh, yeah, you can check out the show notes again, it's just buildwealthcanada.ca and you'll see the episode there. Uh, and then that way you can kind of follow along the episode if you're re-listening to it, for example. And now Aaron is some tracking error normal and how do feel or the MER factor into the tracking error number that we see published on your site, for example, or any of the other providers? Yeah, I would say generally some tracking error is normal. It definitely depends on the exposure. Uh, but first off, there's a fee. There's a fee to own an ETF. And while this is you know, generally quite low, this amount is actually deducted before the returns are credited to you as the investor. So it might cause a very minor difference in the ETF's returns relative to the benchmark or the index, because of course the index does not have a fee. Uh, but there's other reasons uh, that you might see tracking error as well. So uh, a couple, one of them would be currency hedging. So if you're looking at a US and international equity ETF that's hedged, Um, Asset managers are actually using futures contracts to hedge the currency, and these are renewed every month. So if there's dramatic movement in currency, um, that can show up as as tracking error. On the flip side, this can actually be a benefit too, and you can end up with a negative tracking error if the currency moves in the right direction. So, uh, But that can cause a bit of tracking error as well. Another thing that you might want to consider is sampling. So uh, most equity ETFs hold every stock in their benchmark even if there are thousands of them. Um, But one exception, and I'm sure there are more out there, one exception I can think of on our own shelf is uh, ZEM, our Emerging Markets ETF. Um, So for this, we take, we call it an optimized approach. So while it's not a full replication of the index, uh, there are some smaller positions that are less liquid and really don't make an impact on on the returns. So they they might be excluded. Um, And then if I also think of bond index funds, uh, you know, you can never really get full replication on the on a major DEX index. It's just enormous, and that would that would be a lot of work and management. Uh, they also include uh, like illiquid bonds that the fund couldn't even buy if they wanted to. So, uh, bond a lot of the bigger bond ETFs tracking those aggregate indexes, they have no choice but to use sampling. Uh, so, what sampling is? You buy a smaller number of of the securities in the portfolio with the goal to approximate the overall look, feel, taste of the index. So for a bond ETF, you're going to look at things like term, coupon, and duration to try to make sure that your tracking error is lower. But that can lead to some tracking error depending on uh, the portfolio manager's ability to replicate it as best as they can. And then last thing I could say that would uh, contribute to uh, tracking error would be market timing. So if I think about international emerging markets type exposures, a lot of the times their markets aren't open when ours are open. So the valuation, if there's trading within the portfolio could differ and that could end up uh, showing up in the difference in returns as well. So just a few things to, to consider there that might lead to it. But then I, I would also say like, some ET, depending on the exposure, I mentioned international emerging markets ETFs. For those, you might be a little bit more accepting of a 50 basis point tracking error. But for something like, the S&P TSX composite, you'd want that basically to just be the fee, right? There's no reason if you're investing in Canadian index 
you're holding all the securities in the index. There's no currency hedging. There's no sampling. It should really just be, you know, under 10 basis points tracking error. Gotcha. And how can you find out if the ETF you're looking at uses sampling versus not? Yeah, that's a good question because I've had to do that many times, even for our own. We have a hundred and somewhat 50 ETFs. So sometimes I forget which ones sample and which ones don't. But if you just go mm-hmm. to the website under holdings, you can see the number of holdings. And then if you actually Google the index, when you go to the index fact sheet, you'll find the number of holdings in the index, the number of holdings in the ETF. And if those two numbers are off, then you know there's some sort of sampling or optimization going on. Gotcha. So something like you go to BMO ETFs, you look up, let's say, ZCN as an example, that always shows you what index you are trying to basically mimic. So that's where you get that name. And then you can essentially Google that index. Um, like in like with SMP, it'd be like you know, SMP TSX for Canada, for example. And then you can see that those the holdings there match what the BMO ETF is holding. And if it's not, that means sampling is being used. Did, did I understand that correctly? Yep, that's a good check for it. Gotcha. Here. Gotcha. Awesome. And if it is uh different, then you know, okay, the tracking error might be high or higher potentially. But then you also want to come, like if you're debating between like a BMO ETF and like a Vanguard ETF, let's say, okay, but then you kind of want, then you can sort of compare it that way to see which way, how good is the tracking around this one versus the other. Is that kind of how people would do it? Yeah. Like sample, sampling isn't a bad thing at all, as long as they're managing it correctly. Um, so yeah, if you want to look at the tr- the tracking error and see if, it, if they are managing it appropriately, that's a good way to do it. Gotcha. Okay. That sounds good. And this, I think you, you kind of, covered this already, but I'll ask this question again, just just in case there's anything you wanted to add. At what point would a tracking error be considered high? And does that number vary depending on which index we're looking at? So like S&P TSX and CAT, which is for Canada, versus something like MSCI emerging markets? Yeah, so definitely it depends on the exposure. I would say like from my experience on the, on the product team at BMO ETFs, if there was a tracking error of above 50 base, 50 basis points to 100 basis points, we would we would look at that. We would say, why is this happening? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a good thing to look at for investors as well, you know, that 50 to 100 basis points. But again, it depends on the exposure rate, depends on the fee of the ETF. Um, but uh, that's sort of a range I would maybe begin to look under the hood a little bit. Sounds good. And then you mentioned as well the other report that you can then click on to drill down and actually see, okay, was there some sort of special event or circumstance that would cause it to be higher, maybe just this one time. And then you can kind of make your own judgment call on that. Okay. Well, well thank you for that. Yeah. Cause it's like, what's high, what's low? Well, it's relative. Right. And yeah. so it's good to, it's good to compare, um, especially if someone's like comparing a Canadian S and P T S X index to like an emerging markets yeah. to not kind of have that same expectation necessarily. So, or yeah, like if they're using sampling versus not, for instance, that's great. Uh, Joe, it seems like with the thousands of investment products out there, the definition of the word passive can really vary quite a bit, not just amongst individual investors, but amongst companies offering these products as well. Uh, I think, Aaron, you brought up Wealth Simple, right? Which is kind of like a, a good kind of Canadian example of that. You know, I've even heard arguments about, for example, that the S&P 500, you know, not actually being technically at 100% passive, you know, as there is still a committee that chooses which stocks are included in the S&P 500 index. Can you speak to that a bit? And also, how do you think individual investors should define passive versus active? Sure. And, you know, even and Aaron hit on some great examples I'll, t- I'll touch on as well when, when you're talking about indices that are passive around the world, uh, the different markets and, and you know, the S&P 500, uh, the large part, you've got also the 400 and the 600 going to the mid and the small cap. And so each of those is uh, an active choice really on the part of the investor to, to say, I'm going to take this part of the allocation in this weight and put it in my portfolio. And so I'm of the school of thinking that that you know the passive is is a becoming a bit of a misnomer in this space. Uh, I think it's really more about rules based, um, having strategies that you know ha- follow some some discipline and transparency in how they operate and rebalance and select stocks or bonds. Um, and in that umbrella, you know this passive bucket is really diverse, right? We have many different approaches, as you mentioned, thousands of ETFs. Uh, ranging, you know, f- from from very narrow thematic themes to to broad indices to regions, um, but they're being used in very kind of, kind of active ways. Um, and just to, to step one one step back in the international space, for example, 
you know, you, we I, I talked to a lot of investors uh, for years around around the world as you have, and and because of things like Spiva and because of the data that everyone can see, uh, many outside of North America would say, you know, we're we're sold on using indices for for U.S. Uh, stocks, for example, right? Because it's just so hard to dedicate uh, the time and create very little excess return there as an active manager, but. You know, we hire smart managers to run in emerging markets or in small caps or so so uh, thought of less uh, efficiently priced spaces. And it made me remember how, uh, you know, a little over 20 years ago, I was, um, you know, I wasn't a kid, but I was young enough before I was really in this business that I, I saw a profile on TV of a very famous uh, emerging markets manager. And, uh, you know, the reporter was wowed by how this this person, this PM was traveling around, you know, in this factory in Thailand and this construction site in Brazil and, you know, putting the hard head on and, and looking at everything with a keen eye. And I thought that looks pretty cool. This must be a smart person. I, I think I won't name them, but history would say they, are, they were. But, um, you know, fast forward a couple of decades, and I found myself in, in finance on the factory floor in another country. You know, in a plane to to a construction site somewhere else, on these diligence trips. Uh, and to make a long story short, you know, firms will will show you what they want to show you, right? The the idea of that of these kind of secret attributes that no one can find are becoming less and less uh, prevalent as data is more pervasive, as information is more transparent, and so markets like emerging markets or small caps um there isn't necessarily in, in public markets anyway that kind of inefficiency that may have been there a long time ago and so even with spiva results we're seeing you know upwards of 90 percent underperformance rates in em in small caps which points to again the use of indices for these exposures now i, I come full circle on that and, and the fact that those are active choices to put em in a portfolio to put small caps at some allocation and when you aggregate, we did this work a few years ago, uh, where you, if you aggregate all of the so-called passive ETFs up into this kind of giant ball of a portfolio and look at what it's exposed to, you know, it's very different from the market, right? It has kind of this momentum tilt to it. It has a smaller cap bias. So people are using passive instruments that in and of themselves are tilts in different directions and using them in very active ways in these ETF models as building blocks. Uh, but the key thing is, I think that there's that you know they're saving money doing it and getting a little more control. Uh, the last data point I'll share on this passive uh, evolution is is around fees. Uh, we we started doing a report a few years ago where we looked at the the amount of assets that are indexed um, to benchmark to our indices, right? And and long story short, if you look at kind of the key, you know, at the end of twenty one, we found that uh, across the key benchmarks, the 400, the 500, the S&P uh, 600, uh, and beyond that, we found over 10 trillion in assets were indexed uh, to our major indices, about 7 trillion of that to the S&P 500. When you look at the cost savings, you look at the average fees for, for index uh, funds versus the average fees for active funds, uh, we calculated the investors have saved a little over $400 billion in fees over the last 26 years uh, from indexing. So to Aaron's point, you can still take these passive instruments that are proliferating in all sorts of different ways, build them into an active portfolio of ETFs, you know, tie it with, with other things that are not indexable. Uh, and that fee savings becomes a really significant part uh, of the investor return over time. And Aaron, and uh, switching things over to you, I think it'd be good for investors to know about what the difference and implications are of a capped index versus an uncapped index. Can you explain these a little bit? Yeah, I think, um, well, a, cap, a capped index is basically an index that has a, a limit on the weight of an individual security within the index. Um, so for market cap indexes, that this means that if a company gets too big, they'll just cap it out at say 10 or 20%. Uh, uncapped, of course, is the complete opposite. It just takes market cap and, and gives it that higher weight if it's a, a bigger company. Um, but I think if if a market index becomes too concentrated in sort of a handful of stocks, it can really distort the diversification benefits that I think a lot of investors are after when they go uh, to invest in a broad index. Um, and it can lead to index returns being just driven by almost entirely by those very large components, right? If we look at 
uh, the S&P TSX capped composite index, ZCN or ETF that tracks that, uh, it restricts the weight of an individual holding to, to 10% regardless of its market cap. And there's, there's a bit of a story around how that came about. Um, most of us remember Nortel Networks, uh, whose share price went from 1,000, over 1,000 to 10 cents a share. Uh, and at its peak in the early 2000s, uh, it accounted for almost a third of the total market cap of all the stocks in what was formerly the TSX 300 index, which was an uncapped index. Uh, so a huge company like Nortel with, you know, 320 billion market share exerted just this huge influence on the overall performance of this index prior to its demise. We all know how, how that story ended. Uh, but it's interesting is that this Nortel collapse is what actually spurred the introduction of that S&P TSX cap composite that we all know and love today. So that's sort of a story uh, in terms of how capping came about. Is there also an S&P, like, can you get an ETF that's like S&P TSX uncapped? Is there a version like that? Do you know? Uh I'm not sure. I, I know like TSX 60 has a, a 25% cap. There's a lot of indexes that okay, have so a bit the cap of a wider cap. Vary. Yeah. Gotcha. Like S&P 500 gotcha. actually has a cap as well. Uh, I think it's about 23%. So those are, those are wider caps though. Um, but yeah, you can, there's also a total market index ETFs that'll invest in sort of the, the whole market too, if you're looking for that true passive approach, but uh a lot of them will have caps if you look under the hood. They don't always necessarily say it in the index name. You know, if you take S&P 500 as an example with the cap of 23%. Uh, and that's really just why it's so important to, to be looking under the hood and to, to read that methodology and see what kind of risk management there is in place. Because uh, that's what capping really is at the end of the day. Yeah, and usually you see that not, I guess not always, but usually when I've noticed that it, it's, it's actually right in the ETF name. Like I know with your, with your BMO ETFs, it's, it's right in there. So yeah, I just thought it'd be good to ask that question so that when a listener sees that they actually know what, what that means. Uh, and, and yeah, I think it's great. I mean, it, this way we don't get into these situations where someone thinks that they're very well diversified, you know, but, you know, from coming to a company, but really it's, it's uncapped, let's say, and then they actually have a disproportional amount in, in the particular company, or I guess it'll be a proportional amount, but you don't want to have Basically, they they have more eggs in the basket than they want to have than in one basket than they want essentially, right? Yeah. Um, that can be an easy trap to fall into. So um, now usually we see the Canadian index, so the S and P TSX being capped when it comes to ETFs, like with your ETF ZCN. What about core index ETFs for other countries like the US? You've you've kind of already mentioned with S and P five hundred uh, and beyond. Are those typically capped as well? How common is this sort of capping? Like I know in Canada, it's it, it seems to be very prevalent. Um, what about these other countries? Yeah, I would say it depends on the index for sure. So that's why you always have to read the the methodology. But there are a lot of indexes that have uh, caps. And as I mentioned, usually a wider cap than a 10% um, that, that won't have it in the name of the index. So uh, yeah, okay. like the S&P 500, for example, that, that's the one we all know. And uh, even some international uh, exposures as well will have a cap, but it it definitely depends on the index. So I can't speak too uh, too broadly on that. Okay. Well, is, yeah, something that's good to know, I think, when people are doing their due diligence, mm -hmm. right, to actually look and see, okay, is this capped? Is it uncapped? Because I'm glad, glad you brought that up. It's not always in the name. It's, it's nice and convenient when it is. Yeah, and <laughs> like some, the, uh, some investors uh, might yeah. have a call on it, right? They might not want a cap. They want their winners to run, and they want all the exposure there, and they're not scared that if, you know, a Nortel happens. Uh, so it depends on on what you're looking for there, but there's definitely, you can get into the weeds as far as you want to go by a quick Google of the index. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that sounds good. And I guess the other, maybe it's worth mentioning now too, the other kind of variation is the, the equal weight mm -hmm. ETFs, right? Where it's not market cap weighted. It's just equal kind of across the board. Can you maybe define that just for anybody that's maybe new to this and, and hasn't really heard about these different variations before? Yeah. Equal weight, just as it sounds, e even weight to all the, the holdings in the, uh, in the index. So we've done it at BMO on a lot of our, our sector ETFs because we found the specific sectors were the ones where we really saw the concentration in those, in those higher uh, market cap names. And, and this just is really a, a risk mitigation strategy, right? It, it just spreads the investments evenly over all the holdings so that one is not going to dominate uh, 
the influence on your returns. And uh, we've, we've done it in sectors, but there's also an equal weight S&P 500 out there. BMO doesn't have one, but there's, uh, uh, Joe, you can probably uh, touch on that as well. I know S&P has a lot of equal weight indexes. We do, and it's a very, you know, it's it's a very interesting approach for a lot of reasons. Uh, we could discuss for another day. We've written and researched a lot about this. I think if you go to our blogs and papers, you'll find that kind of why equal weighting and why and when it really um, can be a powerful approach uh, to move away from market cap. But again, it's a prime example of what we were discussing earlier around, you know, what really is passive. Right? You make that choice uh, around weighting, whether it's capping or equal weighting, uh, you name it. Uh, you know that that's a decision. That's an active decision on the part of the the manager to to take something like that on uh, an investor, I should say. And so, um, you know, we, we embrace that and offer those kinds of choices uh, that people are using in very uh, tactical and active ways, frankly. And, and yeah, maybe just to make it uh, beginner friendly, when we are talking about equal weights, and feel free to jump in if if you feel I'm not explaining it correctly. It'd be so for Canadians here listening, it would be something like the amount you have in Shopify would be the, which is an enormous company here in Canada, uh, relatively speaking, would be the same as some small cap company in Canada. You would kind of have the equal amount of both of them, even though one obviously has a much, obviously Shopify has a much bigger footprint in the index than this much, much smaller company. So that would be the, the equal weighted approach. Would that be a good way to define it, guys? Absolutely. I think our at BMO ETFs are uh, most widely held ETF is or in the equal weight space is ZEB or equal weight banks ETF. So it holds the six major banks. And instead of Royal being the biggest weight, you're evenly spread across all the six major banks in Canada. So, yeah. And I think it, is it fair to say that usually when someone's looking at ETFs and they're considering kind of the default it's at least from my perspective it seems the default is usually that they're they're cap weighted so something like shopify you would hold a lot more of that than some small cap company because it's it's market cap is a lot higher and so you kind of have a bit more eggs in that basket because it has a bigger uh, footprint would that be an accurate way of explaining it yeah that's sort of traditional traditional passive approach would be that market cap approach and then things have sort of evolved from there to include yeah. equal weighting and other weighting Gotcha. Strategies. Gotcha. Yeah. So the equal weighting, the market cap, and then you can have market cap, but then you, you have certain caps on that so that we don't get into the Nortel scenario. So those are kind of, I guess, the sort of three different flavors that we're talking about. So yeah, thanks for, I thought it'd be good to define them because I would say the vast majority of people didn't learn this in yeah. post-secondary, <laughs> you know, like unless they're in you know, like a finance business program, sure. this tends to not be covered in, my, I know my kids aren't learning in an elementary school right now. So unfortunately not. <laughs> So unless you majored in it, you're probably, yeah. So anyways, I, I thought that would be good good to know sort of the, these different variations. And, and just so, as well, I think when people are doing their due diligence, they can, you know, they see these terms, which is, I guess, our industry jargon, and they actually know what it means and, and what the potential implications are and the pros and cons. So, um, and it really meshes well with your point, Joe, about, well, what is passive then? Because you're, you're kind of making a call, which one you want to go with. So now is that being active again? It, it's It's interesting how that plays out. Where it's like different different degrees of active, I guess. Yes, and I agree. And I, if, if I can offer one quick quick uh, educational plug on the equal weight front, and if you go to uh, again some of the place I mentioned, indexologyblog.com, for example, and search equal weight, you'll find a, a, a host of great you know short pieces on how equal weight behaves and when. Um, I'll, I'll uh, give uh, praise to my colleague Anu Ganti, for example, who wrote a great piece last year around. Looking at concentration uh, in in an index and seeing you know, when that it rises or falls, uh, how that influences the performance of equal weight, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. But feel free to go read those sorts of pieces for more. Good teaser. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and yeah, we can link out to those in the show notes as well. But I mean, yeah, SMP, you guys are so massive that I think even, even if you just Google it, you guys tend to show up near the top. So that's a nice perk of the of, of being such a, a, a dominant force in the space. It's it's great. Joe, in the past, you've mentioned how indexes help us manage our own human behavioral biases and overcome market hurdles that can otherwise derail our investing success. You know, can you elaborate on this a little bit? Yeah, sure. It's funny when you talk about derailing our own success. It reminds me of how uh, I was working late last night and, and um, stumbled upon a bag of unopened cookies in the cupboard, and you know derailed my my diet success. <laughs> but I, I bring it up as a 
is a personal example of behavioral biases. They go, well, this is okay. I had a good lunch, a salad, right? The cookies won't matter, but it does matter. So, um, yeah, you know, else reminds me, I love this behavioral question, right? Because we're all we're all people in the end, and and markets, uh, you know, as efficient as you may or think they are or are not, they're full of people who who enact their decisions and and time horizons and risk aversion, et cetera. And it reminds me of one study there probably hundreds like this that you could find as well. But one that I read recently, it was, um, I think it was done back in 1980 from a, a Swedish psychologist who, who researched, uh, he basically did a survey across students in Sweden and the US and asked them um, where they would rank themselves versus their peers as drivers. You know, how good of a driver are you? Um, as you can imagine where this is going, you know, well over 90% of them said they were uh, well above average as drivers, right? And And of course, you know, when I'm driving around, you know, I tell my wife I'm a good driver. She she would disagree, uh, but uh, you know, we. So I realize I'm subject to this, this exact same kind of overconfidence bias, right? Uh, that leads to investing, where you see these biases play out real time in the markets. Um, sometimes there are even indices that that harness these biases into investment strategies. You know, overconfidence, for example, is something we see a lot when we talk about. You know the era of of meme stocks, where or periods when when uh, you know many things are rising, uh, people tend to really get into the investment space as individuals. They start to believe they're they've got a lot of skill, especially if they've invested a lot of time. There's some confirmation bias happening. Uh, other things you can look into like risk aversion, you know, recency bias, all sorts of psychological phenomena that play into our investment decisions. Uh, when you net all these together, you still find that the uh, year after year, the individual investment return tends to be lower than the market return. People are moving around and trading, uh, you know, selling at lows and buying at highs uh, because of their cognitive tendencies. Now, I, I think if you if you take this back a step, you can look at um, indexes as a, a sort of a solve to this in a way. Uh, on one hand, uh, like we talked about from the beginning, you know the the uh, the discipline of rebalancing, and, and Aaron touched upon how sometimes that's that's hard, right? When you're selling a winner and you want to see that winner continue, but you're trying to get things back into an allocation that you committed yourself to. Um, you know that's fighting against the tendency to fuel momentum. And I bring on momentum as as a factor. There are indices around this. There are ETFs around this that look for stocks that have got that kind of you know upward motion and the the investment world is continuing to push them up as people you know follow follow things and, and confirm their own biases and, and and fuel the stocks higher you can do that systematically through an index right that captures this um, values the same way low volatility is another one where you know people have this uh it won't go into all the research but this kind of uh, a distorted view of risk and return that that causes lower risk stocks to sometimes outperform um, but I bring this all up because these are all indexable strategies that you know many I I issuers and others uh, have captured in ETFs. Uh, if you're aware of these biases and you know your tendencies or think you know you, you, you know you can get a little caught up, it's easier to like you said, go with an index, like Cornell, spend your time on other things, right? And, and get the allocation right. That can be your your work rather than trying to um, get down into the details because the the last you know point I'd mentioned when it comes to individual stocks and one of the reason indexes work over the long term one of the reasons we see uh active manager underperformance over the long terms is the presence of, of skewed returns and what i mean by that is that over the long term the majority of stocks underperform the index itself right that's it's you looked at a distribution it's skewed there's a few stocks driving a lot of the return but most of them are not making that happen there are times when that shifts and, and you know that may be a more beneficial environment, but it tends to be temporary. And so going back to behavior, you know, you, I think it's important to recognize, uh, at least ask yourself, what might I be getting wrong if I don't think I have all the information, even if I do, and, you know, the odds are stacked against me. Um, indexes are increasingly the way to stay diversified, nimble, and, and low fee. Wonderful. All right. Well, well, thank you to both of you for coming on. This has been really fun. I, I've really enjoyed it. Aaron, uh, to end things off here, can you tell us where we can learn more on your end and perhaps let us know about the ETF Market Insight sessions that you run every week where listeners of the show can actually submit their questions and have them answered live? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on today, Cornell. This is great. Um, so BMO ETFs has created a uh, 
a bunch of different resources for, for do-it-yourself investors. The first is our YouTube channel, ETF Market Insights. Uh, on here, I host a, a weekly show where I bring on all kinds of different industry experts and talk about the markets, talk about different ETFs, um, again, specifically for the DIY investor. So hopefully you can check that out and subscribe. Uh, we also have an accompanying website, etfmarketinsights.com, where we have a whole host of resources, white papers, uh, blog posts, as well as tools to help you actually uh, compare and select ETFs. We have a screener tool and a comparison tool that looks at all the ETFs available in Canada um, to just help you build better portfolios at the end of the day. So I hope you can check both of those things out. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll link to those as well. And yeah, I did want to say, I think it's really great that you guys are providing the, the ETF market insights, letting investors actually ask their questions. If for anybody that doesn't know, BMO is the largest Canadian provider of ETF. So as you know, there's other like big providers, but it's nice that BMO is actually Canadian <laughs> and you're, you're the largest Canadian one. And, and to be able to for any DIY investor to go on there and actually be able to submit questions and have you guys answer them, I think is a really neat, and it's free, uh, I think is a really wonderful thing that you guys are doing uh, just to help us with your financial literacy and investing and all that. Really a, a huge kind of value. And I, I really, I hope you guys do it for, <laughs> for forever, really, because there's always more questions, especially as things change and the markets change and all that. So so really, really wonderful. So thank you for doing that. Um, Yeah, ETF Market Insights, and I'll link out to it as well. Uh, and Joe, thank you very, very much uh, for coming on as well said this is really fun for me uh, obviously i've been you know back to university days as a business student you know you learn about the smp for the first time and you see it in all the movies and everything and so uh, and like i said i've been referring listeners of the show to the spivo reports for years at this point you know longer than i can remember so uh it's really a thrill to have you on and actually take us through some of the the ins and outs of what you do uh and you guys are obviously doing some really really great work there uh, can you tell us more about where we can learn more from you and your team and again where can we find the spivo reports the persistence reports in case somebody missed it earlier any other resources uh that you think canadian investors would find helpful there's a lot of places you can go i think the simplest portal for all of that is uh, something called indexologyblog.com. It's indexologyblog.com where you'll see on the menu Spiva is one of the choices, uh, all of our research. Um, and that blog is we have people from across S&P uh, putting out really interesting, you know, short pieces on what they're discovering uh, through indexes and about indexes around the world. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. That's great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank Thanks you. For now. Thanks. All right. Thanks for tuning in. And just a quick reminder that I'm in the process of creating a free six-day mini course showing you the details of how I personally invest. Again, just to keep everything transparent, I show you what investments I buy, the tools I use, and how I optimize my investments and finances to pay the least in unnecessary fees and taxes. To get it, you can just sign up anywhere for free over at Build Wealth Canada. .ca, and I'll send you the course the moment it's ready. And it might even be ready now, depending on when you listen to this episode. Also, if you enjoy this episode, please share it with someone that you think may find it useful. And of course, leaving a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify is always super, super appreciated as well. I'd like to end with a big thanks to two of our sponsors who, apart from my investing course, literally keep the entire Build Wealth Canada podcast and website free for you. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Indeed's hiring platform helps you easily schedule and conduct virtual interviews all in one place. And it streamlines hiring with powerful matching tools that find you matched candidates fast. On Indeed, over 85% of employers find quality candidates whose resume matches their job description the moment that they sponsor a job, according to Indeed data. One of the things that I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because Indeed does the hard work for you. It gets you one step closer to the hire by immediately matching you with quality candidates on the platform. Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. And Indeed is an unbelievably powerful hiring partner, delivering eight times more hires than all other job sites combined, according to Talent Nest 2019. So start hiring now with a $100 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash build wealth. Offer is good for a limited time. Again, you can claim your $100 credit now at Indeed dot com 
slash build wealth. Terms and conditions apply. Do you know why asset allocation ETFs have become so popular? Asset allocation explains over 90% of the variation in a portfolio's quarterly returns. So it's no wonder Canadian investors are turning to these ETFs. Today's sponsor, BMO ETFs, offers these innovative all-in-one solutions with the BMO All Equity ETF, ZEQT, BMO Growth ETF, ZGRO, BMO Balanced ETF, ZBAL, BMO Conservative ETF, ZCON, and more. BMO developed these to help provide investors with ETFs that offer broad diversification and they're also low cost and simple to use. These ETFs invest in a number of underlying index-based ETFs and are rebalanced automatically back to your set asset allocation or mix of stocks and bonds. They offer a hands-free approach to investing that is built on disciplined weights to provide exposure to different geographies and sectors all in one solution. BMO actually offers eight asset allocation ETFs and you can learn more at BMO etfs.com. Thanks for listening to the Build Wealth Canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca.